Welcome to the Living Wholehearted Podcast. We are Jeff and Tara Matson, a husband and wife team who is shrinking the integrity gap in our own lives and helping others do the same. I'm a leadership and organizational development coach, and Tara is a licensed marriage and family therapist. We believe that if you have a following, you are a leader and how you lead matters. Whether you are leading in the home, work, or community, we are bringing you biblical, clinical, and relational wisdom to help you in every relationship that matters most to you. None of us do this perfectly, but we are leaning into the reality of our humanity and profound wisdom of grace. So parents need a lot of support. That's a no-brainer, I think, if you're a parent and you're listening. But it's normal to feel overwhelmed and just really ensure what messages you can trust these days. I remember being a new parent and I had been trained as a marriage and family therapist with special training and attachment and play therapy and trauma. And I thought I was ready. Then I had this baby and I remember being so overwhelmed and I couldn't figure out what do I apply? When do I apply? And you, Jeff, at the moment was like, set it all aside. You really just need to listen uh, to your baby and to the Lord. Um, So sometimes there's just too many voices. But it is important for us to come alongside with mentors and resources and just do tune-ups here and there, especially with the wide variety of needs that our kids have today. Well, uh, I remember that time too. (laughs) And uh, there's some sweet things about that and some good challenges. And as a listener, if you're a parent or becoming a parent, boy, uh, yeah, you, you resonate with some of this as well. Today, we hope that this conversation brings more peace and mm-hmm. less confusion. And clarity. <laughs> yes, yes. Dr. Daniel Orta uh, oversees focuses initiatives that equip mothers and fathers with biblical principles and counsel uh, for raising healthy, resilient children. A bilingual licensed clinical social worker. Dr. Huerta addresses issues related to parenting, such as communication, conflict resolution, spiritual growth, discipline, stress, anxiety, depression, media discernment, and healthy sexuality. He's maintained a private practice in Colorado Springs since 2003 and served as a board member of the El Paso County Mental Health Association for almost four years. He and his wife, Heather, have been married since 1997 and have two children, two children, uh, and have two children, Alex and Lexi. Uh, Dr. Huerta, it's great to have you with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me on the show. I'm excited to be with you guys. Well, we love to start with just people's personal stories, knowing Mm -hmm. that a lot of what we've experienced in our own journeys is influencing what we feel called to today. So talk a little bit about why you jumped into the mental health field um, and what were some of those key pieces of your story that are playing a role? Yeah, boy, what a great question. I uh, just as I reflect on that, it was it was a neat neat uh, moment for me. I was pursuing wanting to make the big bucks. I was pursuing international business. Really, is what I wanted to to pursue. Leaving high school, my my mom had told me along the way, "Hey, you're going to be a pastor someday." And I said, "No, mom, I really don't want to be a pastor." And she said, "Well, maybe a counselor." And I said, "No, probably not. I want to be an international business and make the big money, mom." <laughs> so. Uh, my first year, freshman year of college, I was offered a fantastic job at the YMCA teaching youth sports. And I got to teach uh, floor hockey and basketball, indoor soccer. I was going, yes, what a great job. Right. And then they said, you're going to have uh, an assistant. And by the way, Kevin McHale, the owner of the Timberwolves is going to be bringing his son. So you need to do this right. And here's your assistant. And they brought, uh, my assistant, his name was Mac. He was about my age and he was severely, severely disabled. He could barely, he, he walked on his tiptoes, couldn't uh, have full handle of his, of his hands and he was drooling. Um, and I was going, wow, how is this guy going to help me? His smile was beaming. I fell in love with Mac right away. I said, oh, okay, all right, we'll figure something out. And he helped me put hoops up. He helped me with the kids and the kids responded to him in a way I had not seen before. And I said, this human behavior thing is pretty fascinating. I said, well, I'll take a psychology class. We'll see. We'll see what that's like. And I took that. And boom. From then on, I fell in love with the profession. Uh, Mac taught me so much uh, during that season of my life and just began to, to explore the profession of counseling and psychology within the special needs field. And I learned about child development of normal psychology and just love the whole thing. And I say, hey, forget the international business side. I'm going to, I'm going to do some work and some internships on this and continue to find myself just come alive inside. And so I said, okay, 
this must be what God created me to to be. And and my my mom was telling me all along, and here I am. I'm catching up to it. And uh, master's degree went into social work. Love that. And and got into the school system. It was a low income Title One school district. Loved the families there. Got to do home visits uh, in really re- really tough neighborhoods, tough places. Where I remember uh, showing up to a home visit and looking in the refrigerator with a the child there. The mom passed out and uh, from from uh, drugs and alcohol, and the dad gone uh, with uh, gang stuff that he was involved with. In one thing in the refrigerator, there was ketchup, mm-hmm. and that was it. And uh, just the the the, the amazing uh, resilience in this young boy as he was in this environment uh, fascinated me even more as to why some are resilient and some are not. What happens in the environment? What happens from the inside out and the outside in? Continue to explore that, and five years into loving the being in the schools and working with kids and the and the most troubled kids focus on the family called and said hey we would you like to join us here and so with all that combined i have uh just stepping into the mental health field was very rewarding to me because it was just a natural place to go into the depths of the masterpieces of of god's creation what has happened from the inside out many times we we deal with behaviors with one another. We're just on the surface and behaviors. There's so much treasure to be found below the surface. And I wanted to be one that could dive in there and mm-hmm. help people find freedom from things that were just trapping them inside of memories, thoughts, experiences, toxic relationships. And so as I uh, explored that further in a private practice, I got to go so deep with families and their pain uh, but also in the in the realization of things that they had believed along the way and bringing truth over that, helping them break free from fear that was paralyzing and allowing them to actually love because in fear we have self-protection and, and we, we lack trust and so we lose that love. And so all those things have combined to have me just absolutely love the field of mental health and mental illness and uh, bring people towards a relationship uh, with Christ and to find really who they've been designed and created to be. Wow, Dr. Berta, that's a, uh, a great story in terms of how God brought you to a space where you, uh, you gave up the big bucks <laughs> for, uh, for, for big yeah. wins in the kingdom yeah. perspective here, which is uh, hearts and minds and souls and, and relationships, uh, the stuff that uh, God has us thinking about and focusing in and on. Um, I just have a question for you about uh, about through the through the trenches of those those years of of engaging in scenarios like home visits that are really hard and the love that you have for going into these darker places in people's hearts and minds and relationships to help them to find healing. You know how how are you maintaining your own health and heart in your heart and mind? Mm-hmm. And, and that's such a challenge for mental health uh, workers and social workers, people that are in these trenches day in and out. Um, I mean, secondary trauma is a real thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, all along the way, I've, I've uh, maintained uh, mentors in my life that I can just kind of maybe emotionally, uh, spiritually vomit with, right? And <laughs> on sometimes. And where we can trust one another, knowing that we can just lay it out on the table. And there have been moments along the way, key moments where I noticed either uh, potential burnout or, or close to it where I'm going, man, this is just overwhelming. There's so much pain, so much suffering. I'm just making a little dent in that. And uh, each time I'm reminded that this is, this is God's kingdom. Uh, it's just about uh, his, his love for this world. And really that's where I need to center in and that I don't have to fix things. And it's, it's good to have a reset with mentors. Uh, with my family, I've had check-ins along the way where I go, hey, how do you guys think it's going? What's the pace like? Am I available for you guys? Am I present? How am I balancing things? I, I, I tell them, please be honest with me because I'm going to have blind spots along the way. That's just, you know, that's who we are and we have those. Please tell me. And I've wanted to be intentional about one-on-one time with each of my kids. We've uh, we had this journal thing that we developed early on in our lives, uh, in our home life. And that is we put a journal at each of our spots at the table. 
and this is not a journal I would write in my own. It would be my family writing in that journal to give me life-giving words and, and even questions. Hey, Dad, I'd love to have some more time with you or whatever it is. It would go in that journal. And my wife had one, has one, my son and my daughter. And I've just absolutely loved, uh, loved that one. Let me read you one entry real quick. And yeah. this, this gives you a feel for the feel it gave me at those moments where I'm going, Lord, am I in the right spot? Mm -hmm. right? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing? This is one that my daughter wrote to me a few years back. She said, life isn't a matter of milestones, but of moments. Time has a wonderful way of showing us what really matters. Time is free, but it's priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. Once you've lost it, you can never get it back. Dad, make every every moment count today. I love you. And um, just those those different things, reminders that we can get just from written things around us within our home when we're connected well mm -hmm. uh, and listening to each other is so important. But I, I do, I do want to say those mentorship things, just taking time for lunch or a quick call, it doesn't have to be a, a, a really super involved thing has been powerful for me as I sift through moments where I'm feeling either tired, worn out, overwhelmed, stressed. And that just, that's, that's been a helpful thing. And I'll, I'll just share one more story if I can. Yeah. And that was a powerful one. This was one where I felt God tapping me on the shoulder. I was with my son. It was a, a time where we were experiencing stress in our marriage uh, and just in our family. And uh, my son was sitting across from me. He was playing with one of those plastic construction sets. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. Had a plastic screwdriver. And I just looked up at him. We were kind of quiet at the moment. He walked around the table and he said, Daddy broke and need fixed. And then he put the, the screwdriver on my side and then just moved it around as he was fixing me. <laughs> and I, I, I was going, whoa. I mean, that was powerful. Mm. Those were powerful words. Very needed words from God at the moment mm. through my son. And I just wept, right? I just no, started yeah. crying. And, yeah. and my son just looked up at me with his eyes wide open, like thinking, I just put that screwdriver, my dad's leaking, right? I mean, <laughs> and so uh, that was a turning moment, a, a turning point for me, uh, a, a moment that was very necessary in my soul where I felt a shift. And I wonder what momentums are like for us in our lives. We have momentums that we just go with, momentums that take us a new direction. And then momentums we need to make sure we're continuing to follow. And this was one of those where I knew there was a momentum shift inside of me. And now I needed to follow that. And that was the spirit of Christ just really going in and saying, hey, pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. And uh, along the way, let's, uh, let's, let's have our eyes wide open to those moments, regardless of where we're at. And when things are easy, you got to watch out. Um, mm -hmm. There's some momentum there that probably you're going to need to pay attention to to, to make sure you're continuing to grow and uh, in allowing God to shape you along the way. Mm. So, so yeah. good. I think you're speaking to just a principle that every one of us needs to hold, which is checking in and listening, paying attention to the people we say we love the most, our kids and our spouse and how God's using them to, to encourage us. I love those right. words from your daughter. I'm like, wow, yes. wise yeah. young woman. Um <laughs> But speaking to you, encouraging you, and then from your son, who's, who's God saying, pay attention, there's some, some things needing to shift here. And, and then also just letting them use their voice if they're like, I need more time with you. Like, we can hear that and adjust. It's not that we're failing, we're, we're staying tuned. So I love that. Yeah. Good wisdom um, in your storytelling. Um, I can sit and listen all day. So <laughs> let's talk a little bit about all the years you've been working with families. What would you say are some of the key things that children and parents are struggling with the most today in 2023? There are so many things, right? Uh, I've just, uh, we were my wife and I were just talking about this. It's going, my goodness, our son, our daughter, uh, they're 20 and 18, and they're going to be parents here in the next few years. And uh, just looking at things that are pressing in, the one is the topic of sexuality. It's huge. Uh, culture starting early with the messages and earlier and earlier before maybe you're getting some messages from culture around 9, 10, 11, 12. Now it's super early. Uh, so you have to start early and be very intentional. There's a lot of concern around that as to how uh, what, what messages are being painted there. The next one is just worldview, worldview period. Uh, there, there's Truth is up for grabs uh, as far as 
who, who de defines truth, what it is. And um, as parents, we have the responsibility to step into that and be the teachers, to be the trustworthy teachers, the guides in the middle of the wilderness. Uh, I've told my kids when they were uh, pre-teens and teens, hey, pray for us. There's a wilderness we're walking through together. And if we don't get it right, you guys won't either. So pray that we get it right and we get the directions right. Because uh, I'm supposed to guide you along the way. And just be praying for me that I'm doing that right. Uh, that's for your benefit so we don't get lost in this wilderness, right? Um, and we love camping and hiking, so they totally got it as we were talking through that. So just this, as I've said, just really there are so many messages as parents. We need to be aware of what messages are coming in. And then sift through those and have intentional conversations. And then uh, just entertainment, technology, there's so much to keep up with. And the more you allow, the more you are needing to either monitor or look at or uh, help speak into. So if you allow social media, if you allow phone, all of that is putting more pressure on you as a parent to make sure you're involved and intentional in that. It doesn't mean those things are bad, but you're going to need to to really step in and help them sift, sift through that because those are powerful messages going into your child and creating a reality. Uh, and then the mental health side, what does it mean to be mentally healthy? I mean, that uh, there's so many different definitions out in culture and a lot of new age definitions to what it means to be mentally healthy uh, in, in very weird spiritual ways. And how do we teach our kids what are some practical ways physically, emotionally, mentally, relationally, and most of all, spiritually to maintain a mental health in, in a world where mental health is challenged every day by pressure, stress, uh, all kinds of uh, insecurities, messages, relationships. Things are pressing in against the mental health, much like our bodies with food are being pressed into to kind of break down our mental health is, is potentially breaking down if we allow it to. So helping our kids maintain a mental health, that's, uh, that's a big challenge for parents. And then on top of that, just maintaining a house, right? Just the busyness of, of maintaining that financially and then with cleaning it, <laughs> uh, the messes, <laughs> right? The dishes, the laundry. Just let it go. Life. <laughs> just let it go. Just let it go. Just let it go. <laughs> uh, uh, all those pressures, right? All that yeah. combined. So parents have just a lot coming out. Of them, yeah, right? they, they, they got a lot. I hope someone just feels validated. Yeah. I mean, through that long list of like, yeah, there's that. And then there's that. And oh, yeah. Okay. So that's, yeah. why, that's why I feel yeah. like yeah. this is hard. Yeah. Um, so you, you said something really important that I wanted to highlight, and then I'd love to break it down, maybe each of those pillars you just named, um, and get a little practical for parents. But one of the things you said is the more that we let our kids have exposure, which can be a mm. good thing, the more responsibility falls on us as parents. And yeah. I think that's so counter what is intuitive for parents is they're thinking, okay, now I got to give my kids screen time and I get a break. Yes. Well, actually, you just doubled your homework <laughs> because right. you now have to follow yeah, up. So um, you give them an, a phone, you give them access to social media. You now have got more work on your plate. So I thought mm -hmm. that was such a good kind of counter worldview um, of what feels more natural. Sometimes as parents, when we're like, I'm just tired here, go watch a TV show. Yeah. Um, yeah so so that's really good wisdom. Okay. So break down the mental health piece. You said there's mm -hmm. a lot of definitions out there. What would you say? You, how would you help uh, parents who love Jesus and are trying to raise kids who are resilient? Um, what would you define mental health? Um, and what are some of those practical ways we can build that in our kids? Yeah, it's really in those five areas. So I really see mental health beginning with our spiritual pillar, the spiritual area. What is our core belief? Because in that belief, it helps us mentally find a grounding place of, of what, why do I exist? Where am I going? What's my identity? Our, my, my core thirsts are build up, built off of that, a sense of belonging, a sense of worth, a sense of competence, a sense of autonomy with purpose. And so those things are all built within that spiritual area. So navigating that, figuring out where is, is God really real or not? And then the second one would be the area of, of just my emotional world. Uh, seeing emotions as great information and not the drivers. They're, they're great information givers to us of, of something we're seeing that we may not be fully aware of, 
but these are emotions. There's, a, there's a, a unique reaction to each of us through our emotions, to what we're experiencing, what we're interpreting. And so mental health is seeing emotions is a fantastic uh, information giver for you, not only your own, but other people's emotions and living in that world and learning how to navigate that. Uh, it's practicing that. The other one is the thought bubbles, learning how to reach for the better thought and recognizing that we have so many different thoughts throughout the day, and many of them don't uh, get squeezed out. Uh, and so figuring out which ones are those thoughts, where are my themes, why am I, why am I having those thoughts? And then when I'm interacting with people, how do I reach for that better one in order to either be loving or connecting? And uh, the mental health piece also is in those thoughts, how am I treating who I am? How am I perceiving my presence in a, in a room? Am I truly seeing myself as a child of God that um, is loved and is not needing and thirsty for everyone's love, but I'm here to give love freely to other people? And then the next one would be the relational area. That's so um, on mental health. What are relationships like? Or do we have close relationships? Is distant? Am I feeling lonely? Am I, am I all alone? Uh, taking inventory of that. And then the other one is the physical. Am I sleeping well? Am I eating the right foods for to fuel my body and my brain well? Uh, am I feeding it what it needs to, to have in order to maintain my body, including the organ, meaning my brain, uh, well? So the other parts were our mind, right? How we navigate things as they're in our mind. But the physical is actually maintaining our brain, the brain itself, the organ. And it needs sleep. It needs exercise. They've, they've uh, shown through research that through exercise, you can grow uh, growth producing proteins for the brain, uh, for brain cells and neurons and, and create uh, healthy and healthier connections and resilience in the brain as it tries to handle stress and, and the demands that it has all day long. And then demands at night to, to regroup and, and process memories and then start over again the next day. It's feeding it well. And then physically, am I present with people? Uh, we, we're designed to be connected physically with people. Is there affection? Is there touch? That's so important for the mental health side of things. So it's those five areas. As parents, we can help our kids. We can talk to our kids about where are we at spiritually, where are we at emotionally, where are we at in our thoughts, what are the themes, where are we at relationally, and then physically, how are we doing? You know, and and it's just a good check-in place to maintain. It's kind of like that that. Uh, exercise plan that you do to go work out uh, physically. This is the, the, the mental workout that you're creating for your brain. I love that. So I'm picturing like with the littles, um, that tuck in time, maybe putting up your hand and going through like the thumb is my body and giving your little five or seven year old a chance to talk about how you doing with eating and moving your wiggles and getting your energy. Are you sleeping well? You're brushing your teeth, you're showering. And then when we've got a 15 year old, we're talking about, you know, getting to bed on time. That's why well, yeah, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but also just kind of working through and that being a regular rhythm for parents of checking in. I think it can feel overwhelming mm. hearing this list sometimes and going, oh, my gosh, am I hitting the mark? But mm. I love going back to that feedback place is inviting your kids at the dinner table, the journals that you gave, um, maybe the bedtime check in. Do you have any other practical tips oh, yeah. of how to tap into that for parents? Yeah, this is, this is what I love, right? This is, yeah. this is the, the place I love to go into the just the tools, the practical tools. So one of them. I use with my kids, I've used in my practice for many years, is the high five. So it's funny that you, you did the five. And the five is this. You come to your child and you say, hey, I want to give you a high five. Right before they go to bed or in the morning or both. And you say, Here's, here are five things that I absolutely love about who you are. Or these are five things I love about you. Or these are five things. If we had a free day and with absolutely no pressures, these are the five things you'd probably want to do. Or if we could go to any restaurant, these are the five restaurants you'd want to go to. What you're showing is I know you or I want to get to know you and I want to dream with you and I really see you as a precious person in mm -hmm. front of me. And so you're giving those messages before they go to bed because many times our brain is processing everything we did wrong at nighttime. Mm -hmm. And then in the morning, it's fearful. What is going to happen? What are the what ifs, right? And so you're, you're, you're giving peacefulness that you're worth everything, you're You've got it. You've got this, right? So you give them that reassurance. Many times with my kids, I say, hey, here's your high five. And they go, dad, can I give you a high five? And I go, well, yeah, I'd love a high five too. I need that. And then uh, sometimes they'd say, hey, can, can we have a high 10 tonight? Is that okay? I think I need a 10. 
And so we would do a, a 10. And so those, those have been fantastic things still at 18, my daughter, she still said, Hey, can I get a high five real quick, dad? Mm, beautiful. And, uh, we've yeah. done 60 seconds is something she came up with and I've used a lot. And that is, uh, in the morning, this, I was designed. She said, dad, before you go to work, can I, can I just get 60 seconds where you just lay next to me and hold me? I just want you to hold me for 60 seconds. And this was a time when she was experiencing a lot of fear and anxiety uh, in, in her school, life, social, things like that. And I said, absolutely. So I would hold her. Then as, she, as math got better for her, she'd say, well, can we do 120 maybe? And yeah. then she, she said, maybe 180. And it was just me laying there, just holding her. And we would pray together. Or sometimes I'd just, just lay there and we'd do the high five. Or I just would hold her. And it was a great reminder for me that at any time God says, I want to hold you. I want to, do you need 60 seconds? So I started to do that myself in bed. I'd say, hey, God, can you just hold me for 60 seconds? I think I need that. And, uh, and so, and I told my kids that. I go, hey, with God, I'm doing the 60 second thing. And uh, I, my son asked for it as well, just that closeness. And mm-hmm. I really wanted to be intentional about affection in my house. And so I hugged my son, uh, still at 20, make sure to, to hug him tight and just, just let him know in his eyes that I love mm-hmm. him. Mm. tremendously. So those are the things that we can be doing, the little things throughout the, um, throughout the day, day to day, uh, rhythm of life. Another one is a chalk marker. You can take a dry race marker, a chalk marker, and, uh, many lies come through the mirror as well, where people wrestle through, you know, what their, their value or their attractiveness and all that in the mirror. So just draw a circle where your child is going to see themselves or your spouse and then write truths truths about who they are, what you love about them, and just make those observations in the mirror. Have that be what they remember over time as a regular message that they're getting through the mirror. And uh, you'll find yourself getting your own. Uh, the other day, I got I got one on my mirror with a heart and then some truths on there. And I still have it there. I've been looking at it and uh, just absolutely love those life-giving words in the house and creating a culture that's life-giving because we so naturally become uh, consumers of things out of our anxieties. So at a practical sense, talk about in, in your family, maybe when you're sitting at the table saying, hey, what have you consumed all day? And who gets a vote in your life? Who are the people that get votes and saying your value, who you are? Talk about that. It's a great conversation to have every once in a while. Of who's getting a vote? And is that really where you want them? How do they get so many votes? And hmm. Where, how many votes do I get? Because I just need to know, you know, I mean, I, I want to know how powerful my, my words are in your life. And I remember when my daughter said, well, dad, on, on, on fashion, <laughs> there's some other people that get many more votes than you do. And I said, really? What, what are you talking about? She said, well, dad, you, you know, you got to understand, right? I'm 17. And, and so we had a great conversation on it. I said, well, since I get fewer votes on that, I will, I will say it more often so that my votes count, right? Just as much as the others. But I want to tell you, this looks amazing on you. This looks beautiful. Mm-hmm. I want to reassure her of that. Mm-hmm. But uh, the, the most important part is I want to build self-confidence that's honest. And I will tell her sometimes, hey, that just doesn't look as good on you. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. They need to be able to hear honesty. And as I brought honesty with love and, and in those conversations, she trusted that there, my votes I grew a little bit higher where she knew I wasn't just trying to make her happy, but I truly cared about what she cared about. And she made that very clear in our conversation Mm -hmm. uh, on on the fashion side of what she wanted to be fashionable. I said, well, what does that look like to you so that I can understand that and I can give you feedback that's honest. And uh, so we had, uh, we had a good time uh, sorting that out and we've gone shopping together and those have been fun times. (laughs) Have you earned (laughs) any more vote points? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Those vote points, we've had a lot of laughter, which are great oh, vote oh, points as well, right? Our yes. Laughter and memories going shopping. That's good. You, yes, know, that's good. you need to work on, on some of your fashions. So. I love yeah. it. I have, being a dad of two teenage daughters, I'm right there with you. By the way, do we have any mirror markers? I'm going to take that up. I got a, I got a couple notes I need to put on, yeah. the, on the mirror. Thank you for Those this. Those dry erase markers work really well, too. Yeah. So yeah. And surprise my oldest yeah. when she comes home from camp uh, with something on the mirror for her and for something for my youngest right now. Danny, in the time we've got, I, I definitely want to recognize that you wrote a, a great book, uh, mm-hmm. Seven Traits of Effective Parenting. And I, I think just for our authors, you, you've been 
revealing these principles and methods and ideas that are, are that encouraged me in this session right here. But maybe just talk a little bit about what people can find in your book that you published in 2019. Well, this was uh, when I first started in, in the mental health field in 2000, uh, well, actually it was 1999, but 2004 into private practice, I began to see that parents uh, kind of had a general idea of what they needed to do and had great intentions, but didn't know where to start and how to, how to have a, some kind of plan, game plan in place. And this isn't a formula, but it gives you a place to understand how to have high levels of warmth and sensitivity and have high levels of guidance. And, and just boundaries and expectations for your kids. Those two sometimes can oppose one another if we don't watch out. And we've seen that throughout research, right? They have the authoritative parenting style, which is the ideal one. And in psychology, we know that some people get confused between authoritarian, which is all rules and no warmth, and authoritative, which is a high level of that warmth and, and sensitivity. So uh, high warmth, sensitivity, and guidance. And so I wanted to explore that in my dissertation and along the way, find tools to give parents uh, victories in both of those areas imperfectly, but to just continue to work on having try, trying to manage and get those to high levels. And so as I explored those, I found that adaptability is really our first trait that we need to be working on. And, and that is we're adapting to a new spouse, new demands, diapers blowing up, different personalities. <laughs> and it's just a constant adapting to uh, parenting is that, right? You're adapting to unexpected oh, nice. things. Changing yeah. fashion. Yeah, mm -hmm. changing fashion. That's right. <laughs> and what my daughter called early on, that wasn't supposed to happen moments, right? Mm -hmm. uh, those happen all the time in parenting. So, so you've got adaptability and then you move to respect. How am I managing me as I'm responding and adapting to all this? So it's, then you go to respect. And then I, so I saw a sequence of these traits and how they played out so that they could balance out naturally throughout your parenting. And so then it went into, if I've got those two, I go into intentionality. Now I can be intentional because I'm adapting and I'm showing up well to the invitation. Now I can create the right momentum intentionally. And then from there, I can bring steadfast love, regardless of all the imperfections my children bring and the messes. Now I can give boundaries and limits. And then from those boundaries and limits, we're going to need grace and forgiveness to kind of reset things. And then from grace and forgiveness, I go to gratitude so that I can maintain an adaptive mind and reset all the seven traits. So as I explored that in the dissertation, the exploration was, are, are those really beneficial to a child's development for number one? And, and they were, all seven were. And then does it, does it uh, lead to a contributor child or a consumer child? A contributor is one that cares about people genuinely. A consumer is, I'll love you so that I can get something from you. There's a transaction. And so, uh, yeah, found that that it does, if you're working on all those seven imperfectly again, you, you allow for that contributor child to be built over time. And so that, that's my passion to teach parents about that. It's not about a performance thing or perfection. It's about your transformation along the way and your child to become more like Christ, which is he has designed us to be contributors. That was his original design in the garden. And we turned it to consumers within the garden. And so that's, that's what that book's about and uh and really want to continue to help equip parents and we're going to be releasing a um, an assessment here in september that we hope takes parents on a very easy to follow journey uh, with the seven traits and in understanding even if this is uh, i have all seven with one child i may have only one with another child and understanding that our parenting shows up differently with the different kids we've got depending on personality temperament and relationship and potentially age as well. And so we want to give you the opportunity to take the assessment with each, with, just thinking about each of those relationships with each child that you've got. And uh, we also uh, have resources coming out on just age and stage, how we, we want to be able to equip parents in a practical way from the time they have the child from zero, then one year old right at their birthday, and then at two and at three and at four. And uh, with that, you'll be able to get a, a weekly parenting tips newsletter to just sent out to you so that you can uh, just practice one thing at a time. Uh, Beautiful. Yeah. 
Wow, the resources we have, huh? Our parents are jealous. Um, <laughs> the things that we can do now. Well, I need a day. <laughs> okay, so tell us uh, where can we find these resources? Where do you want to send people who want to connect with you and your book, as well as this age and stage resource and assessment? That's coming. Yeah, focusonparenting.com is the easiest way. Everything will be there. Focus on parenting.com. And then just know we're doing little tips on Instagram. So at focus parenting, I know we're telling people don't be on social media so much, but this one more 60 seconds. We want to give one quick tip and then also be able to interact with you in a community that is life giving to each other as parents, uh, as you encourage one another, but really focus on parenting.com. We have many, many resources and we're continually updating that each day. I love it. Well, we'd love to have you back at some point to talk about sexuality. I think that would be a really mm. fantastic topic and a much needed one um, today. So stay tuned. Um, if you're subscribing regularly at our weekly podcast, we'll have Dr. Huerta back and be able to talk about that. But in the meantime, check out, we'll have all those um, references in our show notes. And um, we're so grateful. Thank you for your time today. Well, Jeff, Tara, thank you so much for having me on the show. You guys are serving parents and just uh, uh, servants of Christ in an amazing way. And I, I'm thankful for you both as you're speaking life into people through, uh, through the voices that God has given you and the platform he's given both of you guys. So thank you so much for being obedient and faithful in that. Thank, Thank you, Dan. You. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Lot. And if you are a parent looking for more resources, make sure you check out livingwholehearted.com. We've got everything from executive coaching and parent coaching to professional counseling to help you with all those needs if you're in the Oregon area. If you're a national part of our audience, we've got plenty of other things, including our Dear Matson's YouTube podcast that gives you, I don't know, what, five minute to seven minute clips of practical tips. So check that out. And until next week, we hope that you'll continue to grow in becoming a more wholehearted leader and being a leader you would follow. Well, did you know that we're not just podcasters? One of the best ways to connect with Tara and I and our whole team at Living Wholehearted is our website, livingwholehearted.com. There you're going to find the books that we've written, our e-courses, executive coaching, organizational development, and professional counseling services. And then one of our favorite things that we're up to these days, our wholehearted leadership cohorts, where we take groups of leaders uh, for one to two year journeys together. It's amazing. Uh, while you're there for fresh content, make sure that you sign up for our e-newsletter. That's where we're putting out stuff every month that you want to keep close with. So visit livingwholehearted.com. You can also join us on socials at living underscore wholehearted on Instagram, and we are living wholehearted on Facebook. You can also follow me at Tara Matson on Instagram. We love to engage with you personally there. So make sure you reach out, leave us a review if you're enjoying this podcast. And if you're a mom of a daughter, check out our nonprofit Courageous Girls at mycourageousgirls.com where you're going to learn about the biblical, clinical, and relational wisdom where it's helping you walk with your daughter at every stage of her growing years, helping her to be courageous and confident in a day such as this. Hey, thank you for caring about being the kind of person and leader that lives with integrity. 